Hello, I'm Ellen Asplit, Marketing Manager for the Media, Communications and Cultural Studies list at SAGE. I am a white cisgender woman with light brown hair, brown eyes, and I'm wearing a black top. My pronouns are she slash her. I'm delighted to be introducing this webinar today titled Master the Rapidly Changing Media Industry with Lucy Kung, David Craig, John Oliver and Christian Zabel. A bit about SAGE before we get started. SAGE is a global independent publisher at the forefront of research and scholarship. Our media textbooks, journals and learning resources unite theory and practice, building bridges to knowledge and inspiring and supporting your teaching and your students learning. To go over some housekeeping, this webinar is being recorded. It will be available to watch on our SAGE YouTube channel after the event, and you will also receive a link to the recording via email. Closed captions are available, so if you find those useful, please do turn them on. We have switched off the cameras and muted the microphones for all participants except the presenters, just to avoid any background noise. The chat box will also not be available during this webinar. There will, however, be a Q&A at the end of the discussion. Please do add any questions via the Q&A function and upvote your favourite questions. Questions were also submitted ahead of time, so if you ask a question via the registration form, the speakers will aim to answer these. Any questions that we do not get to, we will aim to answer after the event and circulate these to you. Today's webinar is focused on the dynamic changes in the media industry. There will also be insights from Lucy's new third edition, Strategic Management in the Media. If you haven't got your copy yet, you can get 25% off the copy from sagepub.co.uk with the code on the screen. Scan the QR code or visit the URL directly to get your copy. We will also share this discount code after the event. Finally, I would just like to introduce your speakers. Lucy Kung is Senior Visiting Associate at the Reuters Institute, Oxford University, and non-executive board member of the NZZ Media Group. She's author of numerous books, including Strategic Management in the Media. David Craig is Associate Professor of Communication at USC Annenberg. He is the co-director of the Dual Masters Programme in Global Communication in partnership with the London School of Economics. And he was recently appointed as a visiting scholar at Harvard for 2023 to 2024. John Oliver is a leading academic in the field of media management and the former president of the European Media Management Association. He is currently serving as an advisor to the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology's Horizon Scanning and for and Foresight Committee. Christian Zabel is full professor for innovation and corporate management at Teha Kong, University of Applied Sciences. Previously, he headed the product management of tonline.de, Germany's largest online publisher. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to Lucy for the discussion. Great, well, thank you, uh, Eleanor, and thank you, Georgina, who's behind the scenes for organizing this. And I'm really delighted to be joined today by John, Christian, and um, David. Um, each is an absolute expert in their field, in the field of media management, in where the media industry is going. And also, also, all three of them are incredibly helpful writing this revised edition of the book. Um, what we're going to do in this, in our time to, together today, we're going to do three things. Firstly, I'm going to give you a really super brief overview of the book, what it does, especially what we've added for the new edition. Um, then we're going to move on to the meat of the session, which is really a discussion between uh, the four of us looking at the state of the media industry, where it's going, how it's changing, what that means. And then finally, we've got some time to answer your questions. So I'm going to kick off by very quickly sort of going through the book, what it tries to do, what's in this new edition. And I think really um, what this book tries to do, it kind of says it in the, in the subtitle, which is from theory to practice. So what I try to do is build a bridge between strategic theory, which is an enormous research stream of management and organization and the fast changing media sector. So what does this book do? Well, it starts off by kind of mapping the industry and particularly in this new edition, really mapping the key shifts in the strategic environment. And in this edition, really what's happening is a lot of technology change. So I've included sections on digital platforms, digital platform models, streaming media, the creator economy, the metaverse, generation AI. 
And then the book moves into going sequentially through key areas of strategic theory, explaining the theory, but then embedding them by applying them to a media organization that I hope a lot of uh, readers and students will know. So it will become kind of hopefully relevant to their lives, to organizations they know about. So for example, Porter's five force model, which is one of the classics of strategic theory is applied to Netflix. Lewin's work on culture, on freezing and, un and, freezing and unfreezing attitudes um, is applied to how The Guardian brought data insights into its newsrooms. Pest analysis is used to analyze the, the state and the prognosis for public service media in Europe. And finally, what's new in this section are very um, kind of resource sections at the end of each chapter. And my reason for doing that is that actually the media industry is moving so fast, it's moving too fast actually for the kind of scientific publishing industry with its slightly slower cycles to keep up. So that means for anyone reading this book who wants to dive deep into an area, it might well be they need to go to other resources as well as books. So what I've tried to do is include in each section lists of research sites, industry organizations, also podcasts, newsletters that have relevance for the issues in their chapter. The other new thing in this in this book is actually what I've done with the cases. So the big request from from people using the book is that they wanted more cases. So I've included new companies. I've also tried to cover new geographies, so not just have the kind of Anglosphere. Um, and again, I've tried to focus on organizations that will be known to readers. Um, so the New York Times, this business model trans transformation, the Daily Maverick in South Africa, which is um, an extraordinarily successful nonprofit news player, how the CEO there uses transformational leadership to push that organization forward against a really difficult backdrop. Um, Amazon's adjacency strategies, the challenge Disney has had finding a new CEO, what do, how, how does leadership theory help explain that challenge and how they can solve it? Jagran New Media, which is a very successful digital player in India, um, how that CEO uses the concept of VUCA to, to set up his strategic and leadership priorities and so on. Um, we've got SVT from Sweden, we've got the BBC's 5050 initiative, which is about improving gender representation in the organization. So, so the cases are kind of very up to date, but also I've tried to come out of the normal uh, the normal area and kind of cover new organizations or interesting projects in organizations we know that maybe require some attention and that really lend themselves well to strategic theory. Um, that, with that in mind, what I'd like to do now is actually jump into discussion with my colleagues here. Um, so I think what I'm going, oh no, sorry, 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 sorry. Um, before we go on to that, I talked a lot about how profoundly the media industry is changing at the moment. Um, to take two quotes from the, just random quotes from the book, uh, unparalleled and accelerating technological disruption, a playing field that's changed profoundly and is continuing to evolve. And I was trying to find a way to actually explain graphically how profound this change is. And I decided the easiest way to do this is to actually just quickly show two sets of graphics um, from edition one and then the equivalent graphic from the third edition. So the first one is actually the good old value chain. Any of you who worked in organizations who work with theory will know the value chain. It's a kind of classic way of capturing the basic processes in an organization, the basic areas that people work in, the basic ways in which the organization does what it has to do. So here's the classic one from a newspaper in edition one, pre-digital, right? So we have the basic chain at the bottom, you get the content in, you prepare it, you produce the newspaper, you print it, you ship it out. And then we have the kind of core systems at the back around HR, strategy and finance. Very straightforward. If we look at what's happened to that chain by the third edition, we can see it's become incredibly complex. And essentially the old elements of the chain are still in there in kind of light blue, but two other chains have been added to it and embedded into that one. So we've got a whole chain along uh, to do with producing the digital product. We've got a whole chain around the relationship with digital subscribers because the big shift with digital is actually the shift to being funded by readers through subscriptions rather than being funded primarily through advertisers. Um, and then on top of that, in terms of the basic functions, we have got technology engineering coming in, software engineering, 
and at the bottom, data collection analysis, product and UX design. So the message there is actually how complex media businesses have become as anyone, any legacy media organization has had to build a digital business on top and integrate them. And also how much of that new activity is actually to do with technology. And for anyone working to looking to work in the sector, the most valuable skills and capabilities for organizations are people who understand the new technological areas and how those link into the kind of traditional content creation areas. So that shows how organizations are changing inside the organization. If we look at the structure of the industry, there is a similar move underway. So this was the, this was the map of the sectors of the media industry from edition one. So in this book, this is the kind of classic mapping of the media industry. It's the one that regulators and lawmakers often still work with. So the axis at the bottom, we've got the purpose of the media going from um, information through it, uh, education to entertainment and up on the vertical axis, we're going through the format. So we're going from um, text to, pic to pictures, to moving pictures, to audio. And previously in the old mass market days, these were kind of self-contained sectors. Companies looked for competitors inside their sector, inside their geography. If you're a magazine company, you looked at other magazine companies in your geography, maybe in neighboring countries and the same for other, for other sectors, but you basically competed with other players in your sector, in your industry. If we look at what's happened since then, so what that map looks like for this edition, we see there's two big shifts inside the box. We see that particularly in news publishing, and if you remember, news publishing was very early into digital disruption. Um, the, the kind of convolutions that are happening now in broadcast and cable TV happened 15 years ago in news. So those, the, the successful players here, the New York Times is, the shipsteads of this world, have actually expanded into multi-platform uh, content providers. They're doing text, they're doing pictures, but they're doing video, they're doing audio, they're doing events. And the other big one is the emergence of stream media, which is this sector that's now kind of eating into broadcast cable TV, audio, podcasts, music, film, and gaming. But the big thing in terms of competition, if we take this from the perspective of the user of the media industry, the audience, the viewer, the reader, the listener, the big competitor for audience attention, the big players are now actually outside the sector and they're really the tech media majors. So we've got in the streaming area, the tech giants like Amazon Prime, Apple, massive investors in content, Amazon invested more last year in um, film and TV products than anyone else in the world. But for them, they're interested in content, but it's a kind of loss leader, as you'd say, in fast moving consumer goods. It's a way of holding on to customers for other services they're offering. The creator economy, David's a real expert on that, but really, again, massively interesting content, but they define content very differently. And it's about a way of building engagement with followers, building a very deep relationship. And then the social networks who are using content, um, who again need media content, but they just need media content for its ability to fuel network effects, keep people on the platform. Um, so that's really the kind of shifting context of the media industry, the shifting nature of firms within it. So what I'd like to do now, if I can, is kind of move into the discussion part of this webinar um, and explore these shifts and what they mean for the industry. So let me actually, um, in fact, what I'm going to do is stop sharing right now and move to discussion. And I'd actually really like to kick off with David at this point. So David, um, when you look at today's media industry, I know the way that you actually structure your courses is in terms of the fundamental distinction you see between what you call IP media businesses, the classic media world, and creator economy media businesses. Can you explain this distinction you're drawing and the rationale behind it? Sure, Lucy. Thank you, by the way, for including me in this. I, uh, it, it, For the audience, I have been teaching media industry disruption for over 10 years now, and I have used every edition of Lucy's book. I have reviewed every other book in this space, and there isn't any other book that understands and grasps the need for us to understand the velocity of scale and the form of disruption that's happening in media industries uh, better than Lucy. And I wanna just thank her for continuously uh, finding ways to update and and, uh, and help us as professors 
um, bring that knowledge to our students. And I don't know how much, Lucy, you meant this as a textbook, but it's always been a textbook for me because you provided us with the heuristics, the means for analysis, which I know we're going to discuss further in an example of, of some students' work. Um, just briefly, um, I've been teaching, I, I worked in the media industries for 25 years. I've been teaching it for 15 years, mainly around this notion of, of media industry disruption, both globally and locally, primarily through the entertainment industries. But for the better part of 10 years, I've been conducting research around what I call creator culture, which is the rise of social media influencers, creators, entrepreneurs who harness um, social media platforms and do something quite distinct from what we've seen from Hollywood. Um, and in brief, what I mean by IP industries is the fact that legacy media industries, film, television, music, and publishing rely upon the means in which you can control the production of intellectual property or the distribution of intellectual property. So all of these industries have experienced tremendous disruption, which is another course that I teach in the context of streaming services, um, particularly film, television, and music now. Um, those terms rarely even apply anymore. Um, we now have a whole new set of, 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 of concepts to, to understand. Streaming audio and video have disintermediated every aspect of that value chain and that proposition. Um, but it is still the case that you, um, for most in, in most instances, the streaming services still demand that you have the underlying rights to your content or that they have secured or licensed the rights to that content. Um, particularly when we think about the legacy media industry switching and moving over into the streaming services, these are all closed systems in which you cannot simply post content on Netflix or Disney Plus and expect to secure an audience. Shifting gears over in the social media space, um, the biggest mistake we ever made was to refer to um, these influencers and creators as content creators because it isn't the content that matters. It's the ability to use that content. I refer to it as social content to engage and aggregate online communities, which is their core value proposition. The flywheel for creators is once you have a, enough scale and level of engagement amongst your community, you can then monetize them through an infinite number of business models, some of which bear no resemblance to the traditional media and some are identical. So for example, influencer marketing is quite distinct from advertising industry or even celebrity endorsement. You can't compare these two. But when you have, for example, um, online live streaming creators generating tremendous amounts of money through virtual goods or super chat stickers, some, somewhere in the millions in some instances, um, you have no, you, there's no other resemblance. There's no other comparison to the way in which IP business models um, generate revenue through typically through advertising, subscription, and transcript um, uh, ownership. Um, this is uh, not the case with creators. Creators, quite truthfully, have never enforced their IP copyright um, control over their material. In fact, it would be at their, um, it would be a disadvantage for them to do so. The more um, creators are creating, for example, beauty tutorial and vlogs, the more the platforms and their algorithms drive um, communities to other comparable kinds of content. So um, there's been little to no interest on the part, for example, Mr. Beast, Mr. Beast, widely known for his spectacle content, which is YouTube's way of defining his vertical. Mm -hmm. Um, there are at least three dozen Mr. Beast imitators out there, and Mr. Beast has never once strived to take them down. Rather, they're all feeding into each other's services and communities by virtue of the platform algorithms. So um, these are vastly different ways in which these creators are um, monetizing their communities through what they call a flywheel approach, as opposed to the IP exploitation model of the IP industries, which is trying to um, secure every conceivable business model you can off of intellectual property from plush toys to theme park rides. So those have become increasingly vital distinctions. There's a Venn diagram that would certainly suggest that these two sectors overlap in some ways, and it overlaps certainly depending on the nature of the community that has been built. But the other example I would give is the, the most successful creators in the world are actually um, game players. These are people who spend upwards of eight to 10 hours a day on live streaming websites playing other people's IP. 
they don't own any of the IP that they're generating, but they do have a relationship with that online community who they then monetize through a dozen different business models. And of course, um, my dog made sure to make an appearance in the Zoom. So <laughs> hopefully that wasn't too too quick and that was offered some talking points. Um, actually, I just want to jump to Christian because Christian, you've been doing quite a lot of work on the creator economy, I know. and. Also, the phenomenon of influencers and the classic media industry, especially the news industry, is is in profoundly in awe of the youth of these audiences and is desperate to connect with them. Um, do you do you see any hope for the classic media industry? Also, this question also for you, David, in terms of of connecting with those audience on the in with. The audiences that follow influencers, the audiences, the the audiences in the creator economy, are all those worlds just too different? Should they just kind of sit back, try and learn, but accept these are different worlds? Well, uh, thank you for this question. So I guess there is hope, <laughs> not to be too depressing <laughs> at the beginning of the webinar. Um, so um, I think what David said is absolutely true and really points to a large amount of innovation going on when we look at business models and new forms of engaging content. So you asked, is there any hope of, uh, of uh, approaching those audiences? And I would say, well, these are the same audiences largely which also watch Netflix, so they are just another mood. And if we go a bit further to, let's say, China, um, uh, you could even pronounce it more that uh, what you what you named uh, David with the um, live streamers, that's even more pronounced. So the, if you look at e-commerce or also content distributions, that's all live. So they uh, don't even do those short snippets we call uh, content video or content that is created uh, for online. So that is a, a novel approach. And I guess one thing the industry could learn is this um, this degree of innovation that is really going on, this plethora of new forms of monetizing, of engaging um, audiences, um, which has become much more complex than just either you watch advertising or you pay a fee or uh, some amount of money directly to be. So that could be something. Um, and the second thing, I think, if, if one looks at the at the industry level, is the high degree of cooperation. So um, you already mentioned it, David, when talking about the content creators or the influencers that have a, that address it. And I guess for media companies, it's not maybe less on this content level, but also engaging other players to create new value propositions. And right now, uh, historically, the, the media industry, as you pointed out, Lucy, was quite closed. So you had your contributors, which were uh, working for you, but working with others, that was uh, more or less uh, a bit of a no-go. So we also studied a bit, uh, in quite some detail the virtual reality uh, industries, the mixed reality industries. And there you see an even more complex eco ecosystems, I, I dare to say, because you have much more of technology aspects coming in. And there you see that most of the actors say, okay, we really have to to uh, yeah, co-create, one would say, um, to develop new offerings. Uh, so this openness, that might be something where the media industry could learn something, also in developing new forms of creating value, actually. So um, Lucy, I uh, by the way, Christian, thanks. I always get nervous when my colleagues say, you're right. I think, uh-oh, I've done something wrong. Um, <laughs> Lucy. Uh, I think there's three answers I would give to that is one is it's caused us to force uh, force us to take a much more brutal look at the core value proposition that media industries ever offered offered you of all uh, you are the expert in knowing that newspapers were not just content newspapers were advertising drive drivers of advertising as well as a, provided a service in the form of classifieds those two prop value propositions have disappeared. And now newspapers are trying to understand what does it mean to be a pure content yeah. industry, how to monetize both the content and the people who create the content 
on those platforms. Likewise, broadcast television and subscription television were all built on a dual revenue model of subscriptions and advertising. And those models have been completely disrupted by streaming services, although we're seeing those models return in reverse form going from, um, and now it's seeing a dual revenue stream for streaming services. Um, but I hesitate to think, and I don't think we've seen much evidence that the introduction of advertising on the streaming services is making its way back fully. First of all, these streaming services are mostly global and advertising remains very deeply national. But on top of that, audiences have now moved away from a willingness to accept the advertising model of disrupting their storytelling escape experiences online. And that points to the core value proposition of most of the entertainment services that are out there is they are at its core storytelling services. And that is vastly different from what I would describe how social media creators and creator culture are operating. They may call what they do stories, but that's just a gimmick by the platforms. Um, but in fact, what they're really doing is having conversations. And um, in that instance, I think that these are two very different, different worlds that if they can better, more clearly understand the differences in those core value propositions, they'd have a more efficient way of, of monetizing and building and, and innovating business models to accommodate that. Again, IP exploitation, I've been waiting for years for Netflix to launch their, their stores and their products. And now we have them. We now have the Netflix experience, which is starting to take off all over, all over the world. It's only a matter of time before we have a Stranger Things theme park. Um, <laughs> but on the flip side is I think the, the biggest uh, reason I think for traditional media to be anxious about the social media and creator culture is the combination of the, the scarcity of time. There's only so much time that communities, online communities have now to then um, go from hanging out for hours with their favorite creators to then turning on a story on a streaming service. But there's also the fact that the um, the advertising industry has completely been upended. Um, influencer marketing now represents roughly 15% of the advertising industry, but the whole shift of advertising from linear over to digital is a, certainly a much larger consequence. But um, as Christian pointed out, and this is uh, uh, to me a, a, a really important insight is, and I wrote a whole book about Chinese creator culture called Wang Hong. And the fact that in China, all means of consumption now is conducted through their creator culture, through their live streaming, what they call social commerce sites. So no more advertising. They've leapfrogged over the entire advertising industry that we have in the West in order to build and encourage everyone to go onto their social media platforms and sell their products and services directly to their consumers. Um, in a way that um, has uh, completely challenged any notion or need of the conventional advertising and marketing industries. John, this is your area. We're coming to your area, which is kind of <laughs> <laughs> corporate adaptability and survival. <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, ju just to recap one of the things David said, yes, thank you very much for the book. I, I do remember writing to Lucy an email way back in 2007 saying, Thankfully, someone's produced a book for us. Uh, so, so in terms of uh, structure was one of the questions before we get on to adaptability. Uh, and the, the slides that Lucy put up there were, was structure of the media industry, stroke question mark with all those different sectors, uh, and also structure of the value chain. So if we go back to structure, we say, you know, what has changed? You don't have to go back to the 2007 book, Lucy, because what you've done is you've incorporated those structural changes in the industry uh, and important areas like the value chain. So it's, it's one of the things that, that really is presented in this latest book is, is the structure has changed dramatically. Okay. Mm -hmm. To the point now where we actually don't know how to define the media industry, or if we do, it's probably a guess. Or, or it's probably a definition that's led by uh, regulators, okay? So certainly firms themselves will, be, will, will not be overly concerned uh, with things like definitions uh, of industry. Um, so one of the things about the structure, change at industry level, change at organization level, uh, and one of the things that that really drives successful organizations to do is to adapt and adapt rapidly. So the case that we've got on, on Sky TV really is a case study around organizational adaptability 
how they changed and reorganized resources, both intellectual and physical, to produce what was quite literally industry leading performance figures in terms of financial returns. Uh, and that features it in, in the book under this idea of dynamic capabilities. How do you rapidly change your dynamic capabilities, your resources at a time of turbulence and change, but still being able to produce superior performance? So that word structure also needs to be considered in the context of adaptability. And that's one of the, the, the sort of big things that you put forward in, in the book, particularly in terms of chapter two, when you look at organizational structure, but also in terms of the case studies and how rapidly some of these organizations have changed uh, along the way. Dynamic capability allows us to explain a lot of what's going on in the media industries, particularly from the, the legacy firms less so for the newer firms and the social media firms uh, in, in terms of that. So readers really need to go into what has changed between 2007 and the first book and the latest book. There are big structural questions around industry and organizations and, and also resources. Uh, and the key thing really is one of the things about the Sky TV case study is that you've got an organizational culture that embraces change. They actually say that we embrace change, we lead change, because that's the thing that makes them adaptable. Yeah. And that also links back into a latter chapter, chapter in the book, which is about organizational culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and these firms have to have a culture that is focusing on adaptability and rapid change. We can't hang around in this area. So let's say the book over various chapters focuses on structure, focuses on adaptability focuses on culture, and a lot of those things are tied in together, particularly in terms of when you consider organizations that will survive and will thrive and those that will ultimately die. John, how do you rate the industry's ability to actually undertake the adaptation it needs to? I mean, you talked about culture. I talk a lot about Netflix in the book because one of the things about Netflix is they have a really muscular approach to culture. They've really defined it. They've defined what these cultural beliefs mean for how we hire, how we fire, how we expect you to make decisions, how we expect you to be responsible, be accountable. But they're kind of the exception, actually, I think. In a lot of organizations, the organizations I've researched, the organizations I talk to, there's this sense our culture holds us back from being adaptable. That's actually the Achilles heel of this industry. We're, we're too in love with the emotional, romantic idea of the media as it was. You know, the, yeah. the reporter with his notebook, the Steven Spielberg on set, the, you know, the 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 investigative re reporter. And that is blo that, those kind of emo that kind of emotional uh cultural uh sense that on one hand drives people into the industry drives smart creative people in the industry also stops it from changing D do you see when you look at the media industry do you, do you see an industry that's capable of adapting as much as it needs to 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 get on board with the kind of extraordinary changes david and christian are, are describing yeah I'm gonna, I'm gonna i'm gonna put a little asterisk on this question because it depends on how you're defining media industry <laughs> because <laughs> <laughs> if we go back to, yeah, we, we're sort of back to that again. If, if you look at uh, traditional legacy media versus social media, okay, uh, one of the things in, in, a, in a latest study, the results are just come out any day now that, that I've looked at 23 years of levels of research and investment and development spend by media firms and social media firms. And I've compared those two with the most innovative firms in the world. Uh, and one of the things that you find is that the legacy media, okay, the traditional, doesn't invest in research and development and doesn't invest in significant levels of innovation. And, and the primary driver of that is because they don't need to. They are largely an established, mature industry. But you compare that with firms in the social media area, they're, they're investing 30, 40% of revenue each year because the business models are evolving, the structure of the industry is evolving. So, so they have to innovate uh, and there'll come a point where actually the level of innovation will start to be established. So I think industry life cycle is, is an important factor uh, in all this. So when you compared media legacy versus social media, there's a difference. But, but one of the things in, in this data looked at uh, the most innovative firms in the world as defined by the Boston Consulting Group. 
Um, they came from a range of different industries, those companies, uh, and they were more culturally orientated to research and development and producing high levels of innovation. So I think, I think your question goes back is can, if it's legacy media firms, uh, be, become more innovative and, and change culture? My, my short answer would be no. I, I think there's too many things against it. I think there's the industry stage, which is, is, is massively mature. You don't really need to be that innovative relative to other firms uh, in terms of that. And I, I think you're quite right, it is that the culture in, in all organizations or many organizations acts like a permafrost. You know, it's there and it's hard to shift, it's embedded. And again, I, I keep coming back to, if, if you look at readers of the book, don't think of them as, as separate chapters. The context chapter really is suggesting high levels of change and adaptability. The leadership chapter talks about the best way that, that a, a company might have it in terms of CEO leading. And then you've got the chapter on, on culture. So, so these chapters actually integrate together. And I, I would encourage the reader to consider them as interlinked chapters, not separate chapters on how media organizations work. Maybe if I may add to John's remarks and to strike a bit more positive note, I guess one thing changed that the um, the necessity has become more clear. So I guess in, in many companies, you don't have this old discussion. We are journalists. We do what journalists do and what is media business. So there's one stage. And second of all, I guess it also depends on the necessity to change. I mean, you... Theoretically speaking, you can't really change an organization unless there's any kind of necessity. Why do it? So you can, you have to dictate it. So, uh, and so it, it's a bit of two things going together. And um, if you look at, for instance, the cases you describe in the book, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the change they did, even if they stayed in core journalism, more or less profound was only possible after this rapid changes in the market. So 20... I think just to, sorry, Christian, sorry, just, just to add to that. Yeah, I was trying not to be too pessimistic. <laughs> I was hopefully trying to be pragmatic in terms of that. But, you know, if, if you look at Disney now, uh, the issues around succession, mm -hmm. Bob, I, you know, who's going to replace him? My money is that whoever replaces him will definitely be 60 years or older. And that in itself has a certain outlook because a mature industry values experience and incremental change. You, you, on the other side of the coin, you, you, you're not going to get too many social media firms appointing anyone 60 years and older. <laughs> so, uh, and, and, and again, I keep coming back to it's about culture, it's about uh, organizational change, it's about where an organization sits in the life cycle of the industry is, is so important. Yeah. I would also add that most of the tech companies that have entered into the media space are all run by non-Western, non-American um, CEOs. And that's yeah. because they're born global industries now that have to better understand the value proposition all over the world. Um, but I would also add, again, going back to uh, a, a quick note is that it's caused us to reappraise what we even understand media industries to mean. Um, for the most part, there haven't been, there are no more pure media companies anymore. I mean, NBC Universal is a telecom company for whom media is a, a driver of, of services and products, much like you described the tech companies and your grid. Um, Disney um, has um, on any given year had a third to half of its income coming from its theme parks and consumer products. Um, and even Dis uh, even Netflix thought of as the last standing pure media company, which is so interesting how we frame that in terms of nostalgia. Um, it has now become a uh, an interactive company by venturing into the games industry. So um, none of these are pure media companies anymore. Media now is just a value proposition for a more complex and diverse set of services and products that they, these firms all provide. I would say the same applies whether you're talking about Sony or you're talking even about Apple and all of their media um, properties as well. The, the example I'd love to give to, to John's point around disruption is um, uh, the rise and fall of the what we call the MCN. So in between, uh, in the creator economy, in the creator culture, there are these um, waves of these intermediary firms. They're not owned by creators. They're not owned by platforms, but they provide a whole suite of services 
to help creators, platforms, advertisers, and other industries grow within that creator economy. Um, and in 2009, a whole wave of them emerged off of YouTube channels to be called multi-channel networks. And in 2014, they were all bought for upwards of close to a billion dollars by the legacy media companies. And by 2015, those um, the visions of media companies had disappeared because they discovered that these MCNs provided owned nothing. They didn't even have um, uh, direct um, uh, 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 contracts with all of the creators that they'd signed. Um, that they had not built any libraries, they acquired no content, that they were just simply service providers, which is only further ironic because now they're all referred to not as MCNs, but as creator service organizations or three CPOs, which is weird, um, third party creator organizations, which is a Star Wars reference. I don't understand that. But um, so um, these are all intermediary firms that have come and gone through three waves already just in the creator economy alone. Um, and the legacy media industries could not get their head around it. But I would add one further point is all of the, uh, a for the better part of, of half a decade, the talent agencies of CAA, William Morris, UTA, and, and ICM had a, a huge upsized role to play in brokering cultural products and entrepreneurs in these industries. They're all about to disappear. Um, they've all either gone public or been acquired through private capital, and no one's exactly sure what value they offer much anymore. Because, um, and they are, in a sense, the canaries in the coal mine of what we're witnessing in terms of the legacy media industries. David, I'd like to stick with you, if that's possible, and share your um, students' work. Is that all right? Sure. Because um, we're going to skim through it. We have time for questions, right? Yeah. So if you could go through at the rate of knots, would that be all right? And you just shout at me, so I'm going to go through. Sure, I'll prompt you. So um, just quickly, we do two assignments in my class. Uh, I teach a graduate course in media industry disruption. First, the students have a group project where they're given media industries and asked to conduct a macro industrial um, analysis of disruption over the last year. And it's a bit of a pest analysis of the streaming industries, the game industry, the music industry, and the sports industry, which is twined with media. So it's a very interesting kind of exercise. It's a, also a scaffolding exercise to get them used to ready for their, their main project. For their main project, um, there's roughly 30 students in the class. They each have to choose a media company and do what we call a Kong analysis of that company. <laughs> and that means basically a conducting a case study that engages with the um, rubrics and frameworks for understanding disruption that Lucy very brilliantly puts in the book. So here's the overview of the um, data gathering is, is that they first lay out who the, what the company is, give us a sense of recent financials that again, are uh, point to the way in which they are, are experiencing disruption. They walk us through a series of social uh, strategic media management events, everything from leadership changes to employment changes to the acquisitions of new products and services, mergers, et cetera. Um, as best they can assess, um, they provide us with a sense of the corporate structure and the company culture. But they do what we call a micro case study of the launch of a recent product or service over the last year, not just another film or another album, which is their core value proposition, but the way in which they've now ventured into new lines of business. And then they go through and do, as we call it again, strategic media management or Kong analysis to engage with the frameworks of the book. So very briefly, um, we'll go through, for example, for value propositions, the student, this student particularly did a, a terrific job of helping us understand there are multiple stakeholders in any of these media companies. There are, of course, the people that they're working with, the people that they sign, there are advertisers, there are sponsors, there are donors, there are boards. Um, so she walked us through what were the value propositions for the people who listen to the content on Apple Music, but also the value propositions for the artists to come and sign and put their content on the, on the service. So uh, a beautiful analysis here was a breakdown, um, a comparative account of where Apple Music sits within the uh, larger um, uh, global music streaming landscape and how it has um, shifted very dramatically over the last year uh, to uh, secure a much larger percentage of the market. Um, so um, some important ideas there. In terms of recent uh, strategic media management events, these would include political legal policy changes. And of course, um, Apple has, like a lot of tech companies, been facing a tremendous amount of headwinds. 
particularly by the EU. I want to thank you, John and Christian, for all your help there. Um, <laughs> um, keeping um, American tech uh, companies uh, held to account for their um, re uh, relentless need to, to engage in global domination. Um, and uh, that's vital here. She did a beautiful job of very simple breakdown of the company structure of the breadth of, of uh, departments that any um, leader of any company would oversee. And then in the next slide, you can see uh, more specifically where Apple Music fits within their services division, which gives you a sense of how we're not dealing with a standalone company, but rather a company that sits within some larger division or department. So then you have to understand where they fit value-wise within the larger demands of that division, as well as the larger company. And then a breakdown from there in terms of the company itself and the different um, leaders in that company and the, um, who represent different departments. And so a beautiful job, I think, also of demonstrating a traditional hierarchical structure, which is a bit of a surprise to think that Apple would be emulating some of those, but it is a massive organization. It's no surprise that it's, these organizations at some point reach critical mass. John, I'm sure is a better expert in this. They revert back to traditional um, <laughs> operating structures. Yeah. Um, part again of the adaptability thing. One of the things that we do that um, we may appear in the fourth edition, I don't know, um, <laughs> here in the US, we, um, we're, we're quite invested in, in uh, understanding whether or not these companies are uh, um, uh, addressing the uh, sociocultural demands that uh, have been raised over the last few years, um, if in my opinion, far too late. Um, to get these companies to be more accountable, to um, represent the audiences and consumers of their products and services. So um, we do what we call a DEIA report card, where they look at who is the, give us a breakdown of who consumes their products and services, and then a breakdown of who generates it at the company. So the employee breakdown, as well as any of their DEIA initiatives. And based on those two qualities, they give us a kind of report card that says they, they are closer or less well aligned in terms of helping to um, promote people in the company who also represent the consumers and products and services. And this isn't a, uh, um, uh, a particularly progressive or liberal idea. This is a, a capitalist idea. The idea is that if you're tailoring a firm to address a certain speakable audience of consumers, um, you would ideally want um, uh, people working there who do that. So very quickly, we'll um, skim through the remaining sections is the uh, proverbial Kong analysis. They do two types of Kong analysis. One is, of course, a kind of pest analysis of the company. And then the other is more specifically grounded by the chapters of, the Kong, of, of Lucy's book. So getting into questions of how do you uh, frame and analyze creativity in these companies. So uh, I'm not even going to read these, but just simply point out that the students cannot provide us with analysis without directly referencing Kung's book and say, <laughs> look, Kung says this, this is what the company does. Therefore, this is how one would describe their ability to cope with economic disruption. Um, and so these are all data points that were already raised previously in the case study, and they're just referencing back here. It becomes in many ways a kind of analytic summary of their um, data. Um, technological disruption, again, another Kong quote um, that's, that's listed in both versions of the book. That's on the student there. They've been tracking your career, Lucy. <laughs> uh, again, nothing here is new in terms of what they've introduced. We've seen this data already. I will say creativity is the biggest challenge for my students um, because creativity itself is a kind of squishy concept, but also we're talking about creative industries. So they tend to, to fall into the, uh, well, um, Dune was very creative. Um, I, and these tend to not be uh, particularly useful. So it's a real struggle, I will say, uh, in terms of trying to analyze and rate the degree to which these firms are engaging in both creativity and innovation, trying to focus on the new products and services that they provide. Um, and then the next screen is culture and mindset. Also hard to secure much data. Um, I try to get them to resist going to the glass door ratings online because those are usually just a lot of very, very angry former employees. Um, but um, the students do have to conduct interviews with people at the firm, working at the firm. And um, ideally you get a little more insight there, although I then have to um, advise the students against um, what we call producer spin 
And then the last, I think, is um, the maybe the easiest analytic framework is leadership because Lucy's laid out for us all those brilliant categories and forms of leadership. And it's very much grounded by the examples they gave us earlier of the specific leaders that seem to be most advancing disruptive management in the in the firm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, OK, let me stop sharing there. David, it's brilliant. And I'm so flattered you, you constructed a book, uh, a course around this book. Um, we have some questions from, from that were sent in before. Um, so I wonder if I can, I've kind of allocated these amongst you. Um, and uh, so firstly, we have a question um, about the continued role. What is the role for public service broadcasters in this environment we're seeing? And Christian, I'm going to give that to you because I know you've been looking at the tension between public service broadcasters and publishers in Europe. Where do you see public service broadcasters ending up in this kind of new world we're moving into? Well, um, thank you very much. Uh, I guess um, there's a lot of change coming, as we already pointed out in very much detail. And um, I guess it's also, it becomes more or less apparent that the um, public service media has an important role to play. So we uh, conducted a study just recently on the Austrian media market, where um, there had been a, a large discussion on uh, do we need a public service broadcaster uh, offering news for free um, and thus undermining or cannibalizing uh, private uh, newspaper offerings? So what would happen if we just turned it off? The ORF, the large uh, broadcaster that is there uh, with its news offering, wouldn't that drive up newspaper subscriptions? And we analyzed this in the CBCA. Anything, anyone interested that's already published in German coming out in an English-speaking journal, hopefully soon. Um, but the but the fact was that if in this hypothetical um, situation um, the ROIF would be turned off, there wouldn't be any gain for the newspaper offerings or willing to pay. So most of the demand would just shift to social media to other free offerings. And having said this, it becomes apparent that the public service media for a large part offers a, a contribution which is essential and money-wise couldn't be compensated easily. So um, if you look at the, 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 the level of information that would be lost and the small degree of uh, private money that would be generated, it isn't a really good trade-off. But anyhow, I guess the public service media faces a tremendous challenge in addressing these younger audience. David says, "How can we said how can we address the people who are three who are going to the creator economy?" And that's even more important because the public service media has to find out how to address the people who are, who are going to streaming as well. So everyone who is younger and the generational shift that's that's really brutal. Uh, they have to uh, they have to address this, and this could, in the long run, really undermine the political consensus. Yeah. So, um, moving into that, another question we have, uh, which is, um, I think, for for John and 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 uh, for David, where do you see broadcast media going? in the future. I mean, we've seen the growth of Netflix. We're actually almost calling Netflix as a kind of legacy company. <laughs> what happens to broadcast media? Um, Christian has just said that public service media organizations are going to have to massively reinvent. So John, David, where does... Yeah, uh, it's, it's funny listening to, to, to Christian's uh, ask there. It, it took me back to a presentation by Professor Gillian Doyle at the University of Glasgow, who, who'd been working with uh, the Irish uh, regulator uh, and one of the early conclusions from that work was that the, the regulator believed that public service broadcasting was a strategic asset for the country and therefore needed reported. That, that's a message that doesn't come out too often. Uh, and I sort of wonder whether there's, there's anyone else in Europe or anywhere else in the world that, that believes public service broadcasting is a strategic asset. So I don't know the answer either way, but it, it just took me back to that. I, th I think at the end of the day, we can talk about dy dynamism in the industry, we can talk about turbulence. If there is no value in what they're doing, they're dead. 
Uh, and one of the things, if you listen to, to David's commentary, David, you use the word value, value, value so many times. And that's exactly the right word to use. If there's no value, it, it's a dinosaur, it's dead. Um, so it has to think about, again, back to core values, core purpose. What is it here to do? And then how do we deliver that value to our audiences? Um, my answer to the question is um, broadcast television died in 2010 when 90% of the U.S. population was already um, watching television through uh, cable um, and satellite delivery. So um, by then, penetration in the U.S. was nearly 90%. As it, my, I'm not sure where it was in most other countries, and I hate to uh, be U.S. centric, but that's where I'm sitting. Um, but um, I will just also point out that since then, penetration has gone from 90% down to 65% because, of course, everyone's cut the cord to now move into a new means of, of distribution. Broadcast is just a distribution model. Cable and uh, satellite disrupted it. Now online has disrupted it through both the streaming services and these platforms. Um, uh, so uh, I would say that broadcast is, is, has died a long time ago, but storytelling and content delivery systems have, have evolved. Glass half full. <laughs> we have a question here from Audrey Lang, who, uh, which I think applies to all of us. Um, so please jump in, whoever has the answer at the tip of their tongue. Media creators are endlessly innovative and we as audiences have almost limitless choice. Is the big challenge now for media industries, whatever they are, how to capture the audience's attention, i.e. the attention economy? So, um, yeah, who would like to jump in on this difficult issue of we've gone from a position of scarcity of supply and audiences taking what they could be grateful for to a position where there's a total overload. How, how can media companies, creators battle for attention? Well, I guess, first of all, I would say attention is, is true, but maybe that also has a bit evolved that it's maybe you can um, you can attract this attention in long term subscription model so then you talk about churn and would be much more closer to the telecommunications industry where you wouldn't really necessitate to grab the attention for every piece of content but have a good bundle so i would approach it differently um, and then you have the old attention economy where you have to raise attention for your single piece of whatever you are doing, either via community, as David pointed out, or via uh, mass marketing, advertising led model. So it's getting a bit more um, complex. And of course, yeah, there's a lot of more content and that increases competition, sure. Um, I, I would say that um, the, Distinctions that still are important to make here in the IP industries, content, attention, and audiences are relevant terms. And the biggest challenge that they're facing there is not just simply a uh, massive disruption in their distribution models, but now, as you very presently described in your book, Lucy, is the rise of generative AI and the ability to generate content that is so the easier it is to create content online, the less value there is for um, those uh, content producers over in legacy media. On the uh, creator culture side of the of the spectrum, if you will, or uh, in that in that sector, uh, if we think again less about content and think more about communication and communities and engagement, um, I, it's not clear yet the degree to which generative AI will be disruptive. But the biggest challenge that creators are facing is obviously disruption, ongoing and repeated disruption of platforms as witnessed, um, as we're just about to witness with the takedown of TikTok here in the US where there are upwards of 70 million people generating revenue or using these platforms to promote their, their products and services that are about to lose that business overnight. Now, all of these creators learned the cardinal rule, number one, of being a creator is that you don't build your mansion in someone else's backyard. Um, as you point out, these are all rental spaces. So they are smartly have the smarter creators will have been leveraging many platforms, but that's also a management uh, uh, challenge, right? You've got to be able to build communities across as many platforms as there are available, but also make sure that you're continuing to use those platforms for the affordances that they best provide, which are also constantly changing. So precarity is baked into the creator culture and uh, 
and makes for both uh, fraught sustainable issues and also a um, uh, fun time for scholars and teachers. <laughs> I'd just like to move on to one last question and direct it firstly at John. Um, how can students best prepare themselves for a career in the kind of world we're looking at now? Um, yeah, so and I'm sure it, both of you have views as well, but just to... I know yeah, what I'd do is I'll sort of frame this answer uh, thinking that there's educators in the audience, obviously. Uh, so one of the things that, that I do from bachelor level, undergraduate, postgraduate, executive education, uh, and even doctorates, is again, I sort of keep coming back to chapter two in the book, Lucy, the strategic context is one of rapid dynamism, turbulence, and the need for adaptability. So one of the things that I do certainly, I teach that, but one of the things I also do is I assess students' ability to be adaptable. So one of the key uh, frameworks that I use is scenario planning, where, where students have actually got to find a way forward to build multiple scenarios inside their assessment. Uh, and that's for an organization. So they're asked to look at the most uncertain uh, forces in the, in the macro and micro environment. And then they're still able to create a number of different scenarios and strategic options based in high levels of uncertainty. So the mindset is all about how you adapt, how you mentally prepare through scenario planning. Uh, and that's one of the messages I just keep reinforcing is that when students think they're entering the BBC or Google, they're not there for life. They, they might not even be there for three or four years. Uh, and if they are there for three or four years, they have to show high levels of adaptability if they're actually going to produce a career that, that, that's worth anything. So I think you can actually teach it adaptability. You can actually assess it, particularly through scenario planning uh, as a method of assessment. Thank you. We're, we're nearly more or less out of time. I know um, Eleanor wants to just quickly close up. We also have one question from Philippe Sauerbron, but I just want to come back to it. It's a really smart question. With the growth of generative AI, will open content lose value? Will people go back to crafted content? I think you're completely on the money. I think the solution, what's going to happen is that the squidgy middle content, the totally undifferentiated content, all entry barriers to that area have fallen out. That can be done by generative AI much faster and more efficiently than by people. But I think for media companies, the answer is to go back to the crafted, the human, the distinctive. So I, I think it's a really smart question. I think you've kind of got the answer yourself. Um, with that, I think I'm just gonna get the slides back up. Or uh, Eleanor, do you want the slides back up? Or how should we do this? Um, let me put that back up. Um, yeah. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Lucy. Um, and yeah, thank you to all three of our other speakers as well for that fascinating, fascinating discussion. Um, apologies if you did answer, ask a question and we haven't got around to it today. And um, we will aim to answer some of these questions after the event. So just a reminder to everybody that attended live to check your uh, inboxes, keep an eye on those because we will be sending around the recording um, with some other resources. Also, just one final reminder that you can use the discount code on the screen now to purchase Lucy's book, um, which obviously goes over some of the insights that Lucy and our other panellists have shared with us today. Um, so, yeah, thank you for everybody for attending and to our panellists once again. I um, hope you all have great days. Yes, I actually would also like to thank the panellists uh, for the time and actually for the amazing uh, input they gave into creating this third edition and also to Eleanor and Georgina for setting up this um, webinar, which was, I know, was more complex than it looks on the surface. So thank you all very much for your attention and your collaboration.